Thank you, Angie. And thanks for everybody who's at home watching, uh, watching the movie and listening now. Um, you know, it's a, it's a very heavy topic. Um, a lot of, lot of emotional content and just kind of intellectual content in the movie. It's a lot to sit with. Um, so thank you for, for witnessing that. And thank you for kind of bringing your attention to this panel. Um, I think th this will be interesting. So uh, I'm Drew Deidel. I'm a family medicine doctor. Um, I went to medical school at the University of Nebraska. And I did my family medicine residency training here in Minneapolis. Uh, I'm working as a primary care doctor right now. Um, and I really am interested in mind-body medicine, uh, the humanities, and kind of looking at the whole person, um, which uh, sometimes is hard to, um, hard to achieve working in the conventional system. Um, and I think this movie, this film does a little bit um, of looking at um, some of the problems. Um, so I'm happy to be part of this conversation and I'll let Kendra and Alina introduce themselves. Um, so I'll hand it over to Kendra, thanks. Thank you. Hi, so I'm Kendra Campbell. I am a, a holistic psychiatrist. I currently live in Virginia and I uh, founded a nonprofit called Free Range Psychiatry. Um, so what we do is we do holistic psychiatry, meaning um, treating the whole person in kind of every way that you, every way that you can think of, basically, um, using a lot of mind-body medicine. Um, we use yoga, we use um, dietary changes, uh, nutritional changes, um, basically taking kind of a deep dive into what may be causing someone's symptoms. And then specifically, um, you know, the, our, our even kind of very specific niche is uh, getting people off of psychiatric medication. So um, people will come to us who many times it will be far down the road by the time they get to us. So um, it's stories kind of like we saw just now in the movie where people may have been taking, you know, by the time they see us, they may be on six or seven different medications, um, usually suffering uh, from lots of side effects, usually feeling quite miserable. Um, and they just, you know, kind of heard that there is another way. They're lucky enough that somebody told them that, you know, there may be, they don't have to feel like this. Um, and that's how they kind of find us. Sometimes people will come in that have just not taken any medication yet, and they just don't want to start it. That's kind of a smaller subset, but um, most of the folks are on them and want to get off. And what I have found is that there are so few psychiatrists out there. There are so few clinicians out there who are comfortable or, or have any even little bit of knowledge of how to kind of safely do this, safely get people off medications. Um, so yes, it's a very, um, it, it, it's a huge in, a thing that's in demand very much. Um, and I personally find it incredibly rewarding. Like it is so rewarding to me to, um, to be able to work with these people and help them, help them kind of get back to their life wherever, wherever it is and wh whatever it was. And, many times it's part of it is actually finding that and figuring out what that life was because um, a lot of people say they, they don't even remember. <laughs> like, you know, like what happened? I don't even know. I don't remember what happened before like all these medications. So yes, so that, that's me and that's what we do. So hi everyone, my name is Elena Toskenis. Um, and right now I'm currently in the Chicagoland area. Um, I'm a psychiatrist. Um, I went to medical school at the University of Utah and then did my training in psychiatry first in New York City for my intern year and then at uh, the University of Chicago here in the Midwest. Um, and my training really followed a very traditional track. Um, I started working as an outpatient provider first as my first job out of training and it was in my office that I first began noticing and becoming more and more aware of the complexities of what's been mentioned in the film. So seeing multiple patients who were coming to me from other providers who were on multiple psychiatric medications and also very frequently combined with um, pain medications, narcotic pain medications, uh, given the high frequency we see of folks who are labeled as mentally ill who also suffer from chronic pain. And those are very challenging folks to sit with and help. Uh, I moved on eventually to an inpatient position uh, where I would review patients cases in the emergency department and again uh, faced with the complexities of what we were calling polypharmacy at the time. I recall multiple situations where I'd be discussing with a nurse in the emergency department. She would be telling me what medications a person was presenting with and I would think to myself, gosh, there are outpatient psychiatrists out there who are prescribing this many 
medicines, you know, I'd say, really, this person is on this many medications, this is really what their outpatient um, regime is, you know, and then they would come to us in the inpatient setting where we would do our best to try to manage. But it was over the course of those years where I really began to question uh, the utility of what I was seeing in terms of this polypharmacy and then wondering how is it that we got to this point? Obviously, that's touched on very nicely in the film as well. And beginning to feel that sort of dissonance with how much am I doing uh, as a provider that is adding to this issue versus what can, could I be doing to help illuminate the issue and educate patients uh, as far as their own consent process, like was mentioned in the film as well. You know, how good of a job are we really doing? And of course, that then leads to reflect back on our own training. And there were multiple doctors in the film who mentioned that this is not something that we are taught. Um, and as shocking as that is, it was reinforced to me multiple times while watching the movie um, that, yes, it's true. Uh, it's not brought up to us in training very frequently, um, perhaps with the exception of maybe a benzodiazepine uh, taper and discontinuation, but still not to the extent that we could be um, helping our patients manage these types of questions. Um, so I was very impressed with uh, the vulnerability that was expressed in this film and really understanding that, gosh, these are people, not just patients. These are, these are people with an individual reaction and response to the medication regimen they're on and then the discontinuation that they experience. So uh, a refreshing look at a very, very salient topic um, that I truly appreciated. Well, thank you all for the introduction. I'm just super excited about this topic or this panel because it's rare that we get psychiatrists that know about deprescribing, that do it actively in their practices and that we get to elevate your voice to talk about the, these issues. So we have a ton of questions. I'm trying to like combine them in my head so that we can be more concise, but let's just, let's just start the conversation off with why do people come to you and say, I want to come off my meds? What are some of the reasons and how do you talk about that with your patients and talk a little bit about tapering? What does that look like in practice? What are the taper rates that you do, patient-centered care, et cetera, et cetera? Whoever wants to go first. I can, I can start. Did you want to start, Elena? Oh, no, go ahead, Kendra. Okay. Okay. Um, okay, so what do people come saying? Um, usually they come saying, that they're miserable, <laughs> um, sometimes to the point of, you know, abs absolutely being, you know, actually suicidal, um, suffering just horrible, horrible side effects. Almost all of them will tell me that they have tried it on their own. Um, some of them will say, you know, I tried the 100% cold turkey. Some of them will say I tried to cut, cut the pills and do all these different things that didn't work. Um, what I hear a lot is I went to 50 other psychiatrists and asked them to help me get off of, you know, the psychiatric medications. And they said, no way, Jose, that's not going to happen. Um, so they're always like, I mean, ridiculously excited to hear that I'm not only like open to that, but can, can actually help them with that. Um, what else? Sorry. Can you remind me of the more of the questions? Sometimes I think I forgot. Like, like how do you, how do you take somebody through that decision to come off and what is the taper rate or how do you, you know, judge on the person like patient centered care yeah. plus tapering rate? So of course, the, the beauty of kind of uh, my practice is that we, we have the time and space to really get to know the person. So that's, that's a huge part of it. I have to ask a lot of questions. <laughs> I find out a lot about their history, a lot about their medication history, a lot about them as, as a person, a lot about their, um, what kinds of food they eat, everything like that. Um, and then of course, there's a lot of education on, you know, kind of what I usually say is, this may be possible. It, it may be possible to get you off of everything. That's one possibility. Um, and it may not. Um, it, it may be that, you know, worst case, you only, we can only bring things down a little bit, you know. Um, I find that most of the time, for most people, it's a pretty high success rate if it's done correctly and if it's done slowly. Um, and that's the thing, I think that's the thing that can be the hardest for some people is it's like, they're like, okay, well, how slow do you mean? And I'm like, let me look at your medications. Yeah, this could be a couple of years, right? And so, that's, it, that's hard. And also that's expensive too, right? To, to, to pay for the treatment and to do everything that you have to for those years. Um, so um, my kind of general 
template approach um, is the first time I see somebody, I will, would never change. I rarely, if, if there's some medication where it's just like really, really crazy and needs to come off, I may, I may do that. But for the most part, I won't change anything in the very beginning. Um, I do, like I said, this very, very comprehensive analysis. Um, usually for us, it also involves like doing some blood work and maybe, you know, you know, doing some further testing to try to figure out what's going on. Um, we kind of focus on the idea that there is always a reason. There's always a reason. Symptoms don't, uh, they don't just pop out of nowhere. Um, symptoms mean that there is something out of balance in your body. It means that your body's trying to tell you something. In fact, it's giving you signals. That's what a symptom is. It's kind of saying, hey, something's not working over here. So again, if you just take a medication and just you know, try to medicate that symptom, if you think about it, that's it, never gonna work, right? That's never gonna be necessarily effective. Um, so the idea is we really need to figure out what is, what's driving this. Um, and of course, there's very common themes, probably the biggest one being trauma. That's just, that's, and that's ubiquitous. That's, I mean, you know, almost everybody has some level of trauma. But then there's a lot of other things that could be, that could be driving it or feeding it, um, or at least exacerbating things that are going on. Um, so then the idea is to start a treatment plan based on those specific things. So if it's trauma, okay, we're going to do X, Y, and Z to try to kind of deal with this trauma. If you have a, you know, vitamin B12 deficiency on top of that, well, we better probably get your vitamin B12 level up as well. And we start all of those things. So that's my approach is as soon as we can figure out what's going on, we want to start kind of treating all those different things. And then once people generally start to feel a little bit better, then it's time that we can actually start the tapering process. So I will never start the tapering process without first understanding kind of what's going on and what's driving all the underlying things. Um, because I think if you, just, if you just start taking off the medications, you're gonna have two things. One is the underlying problems are gonna rear their ugly head. So those are all gonna be popping up. Like whatever is underlying is just gonna come out in full force. And then on top of that, you're gonna have the withdrawal symptoms from the medications themselves. And this is why it's so hard. This is why people fail. This is why, um, this is the, the odd logic that you know, some psychiatrists used to say that they then, well, they need to be on the medication forever, obviously, because we've tried to take them off and they look horrible. Um, yes, so yes. So the idea is you treat these things um, and then you have a very slow, um, you know, thoughtful uh, tapering process. And I think they, I forgot the term that they use in the documentary, but, but yeah, sometimes what will happen, I forgot if they, they did, they use some term, but sometimes you'll, you'll be going down and something will happen and it's just not good. Things are not going well and you have to bump up a little bit. Up those, up yeah, up those. Yeah. yeah. Um, and what I always tell people though, is that means nothing. That just means that's what we have to do. That doesn't mean that's where we're at forever. That, it, you know, it just means this is where we're here for now. And now let's try some other things and then we can try again because you can always try again. There's no reason to not try again. So, yeah. Elena, do you want to say? Sure. So first of all, Kendra, this is very refreshing to hear your perspective and understand a little bit more about your practice because so for me, so currently right now I'm not working. I'm homeschooling my kids for the, during the pandemic time. So this has been a very fascinating personal journey to try to educate myself outside of the clinical setting uh, about some of these kinds of issues and some of these kinds of topics. So by the time I had left my most recent job, and as I described, I was working as a basically an inpatient hospitalist in psychiatry in a very traditional small community hospital. And by traditional, I just mean the style of practicing psychiatry was close to some of what was um, indicated in the film. You know, so So in my career prior to this sort of pandemic sabbatical that I'm taking right now, uh, the idea of taking somebody off a medication usually in my life uh, occurred if this patient had come in for a benzodiazepine addiction, let's say. So they present to our unit uh, because we had treatment for, you know, treatment with addiction services. So they would come in for benzo discontinuation or, or detox, we would call it. And we had an algorithm uh, that was just set up by one of the more senior members of our staff uh, as far as how to do that. Uh, and we would do some dose conversion, you know, conversions. We'd usually use um, something like uh, lorazepam to taper. Uh, but of course, sitting here from this perspective, uh, I look back and I think, wow, that really was a one, you know, one size fits all model, assuming that that sort of should 
fit for most people coming in with this issue. And so we piece it together as best as we can. And some people do better and some people don't do as well. Um, and then the patient is discharged to an outpatient scenario where they are expected to sort of continue on their treatment of this. Um, but in reality, every single person is unique and individual and that that sort of a model just doesn't give enough space uh, for for anyone to disclose exactly what this individual's needs truly are related to the medication in question and give the space for them to taper success as successfully as they could uh, if they were in a situation similar to more of what Kendra is describing. And I think that's pretty pervasive um, and it still seems that way today where uh, the question of, of discontinuation or stopping is pretty unusual in a very traditional clinical setting, whether it be outpatient or inpatient. Uh, we are much more familiar with terms like augmentation strategy as opposed to taper or discontinuation. So if you present with issues once you're, if you're on one medication, then the strategy usually uh, is to, well, at least we're taught to first increase the dose, make sure the patient is on the dose for a long enough trial, and then potentially augment. So there is definitely inertia towards increasing the number of medications as opposed to discontinuing or stopping. And I think that there is a little bit of questioning or cynicism out there among psychiatrists when patients come in to request that, you know, um, especially if they're only, you know, I say only, only on one medicine, for example, if somebody would come into my outpatient office and say, gosh, I'm not sure if my Celexa is working or the, you know, Zoloft is working or whatever. We tend to view that as more of a suspicion of the disease itself not being treated sufficiently as opposed to uh, something that could be attributed to the medication in general. So this is, this seems very obvious sort of and, and elegant as I watch the film. How could we possibly be missing this in so many of our patients? But we are as, as sort of a collective trained in a very specific kind of way such that questioning that sets you apart um, in a way that's unusual for most other providers. You know, that's, that's kind of not the direction that we go into. And um, the problems that we have with polypharmacy are really significant because when somebody presents to us and says, maybe I'm not doing as well as I would like in a certain medicine, they may also be taking medicines unrelated to psychiatry that could be playing a role in the discomfort that they're feeling. And I'm sure that, you know, Drew could speak to that a little bit as well, but you know, sometimes, like I mentioned earlier, you've got somebody who's on two or three psychotropics. They're also on uh, a sleeping pill. They're also on uh, one or two or three pain medicines, which now also can be anti-epileptic medications, as you had mentioned in the film, Angie Lyrica, which was something that you had been taking before, uh, an antihypertensive, you know, a statin. So the murkiness of all of it is so significant. And I... Um, appreciated what Kelly Brogan said in the film about how informed consent is so desperately needed, but the way that we practice leaves so little time and space for it, you know, so um, I suppose the takeaway for me is why is it that so many people who present to me uh, saying that, or presented to me saying that things aren't working, our minds shift towards augmentation as opposed to taper and discontinuation. And that keeps happening over and over again to the point where we've got people on many, many medications from many specialties in different fields. So it's a far reaching concern. Drew, you wanna say anything about this? Sure. Um, I'll speak a little bit to just the status quo of medical care and like what I'm seeing. Cause I work in a community health center um, that mostly serves low income, many uninsured folks. Um, most of the patients at the clinic are either Hispanic, Somali, Hmong, African American. Um, and, you know, we might describe them as like low health literacy, meaning that um, a lot of the complicated parts of disease are hard to understand. Um, and so, like the question of w what do I do to the people who are asking to come off their medications? <laughs> that's not something I'm seeing clinically. Um, in fact, what is such a challenge, especially for me, you know, kind of holding the positions I do, um, kind of coming out of residency, starting at this clinic, is that, you know, patient after patient in these 20 minute slots, they're looking, you know, please doctor, please give me something for my back pain, give me something for my sleep, get me something for my anxiety, on and on. 
And it, I think it's related to kind of a cultural perception that has been sold <laughs> that, that the pharmaceutical industry, that the medical science is able to solve all these problems in an almost magic-like way. And so I felt like I was sort of in the wrong position because I was trying to support my patients. But sometimes if I, you know, would try to confront them, you know, with the, the bigger picture, the way I saw things, um, that was actually harder for them than if I was just write a, fill a script, <laughs> um, which is how the, the, the system is really designed to make it easy to fill prescriptions. Um, and the other aspect I was going to bring up, um, sometimes with different cultures um, in, in general, we also deal with like mental health stigma and, um, you know, mo parents who, who don't want their kids to be diagnosed with mental health disorders. They don't want their people to be on med. There's like this anti-medication bias. Um, and so, you know, it's a complicated landscape for sure. And I'm glad we're like digging into it here. <laughs> and one thing I wanted to mention about uh, what Elena, Elena was saying it's like there's this, I can see it in so many ways, just being as a patient and then now being outside looking back. Like when you had sexual side effects, that was blamed on your trauma. When you mm -hmm. wanted to come off, that was blamed on, that's the disorder that's wanting you to come off. Now when you're in a withdrawal syndrome, that's discontinuation syndrome, where it's like, it's always the patient's fault. Even, even I've gotten it from peers that say like, well, didn't you read the pamphlet? And it's like, yes, I read it. And it didn't say what I was going to experience, which is what I'm experiencing now. So there's it. Oh, and the last one is like withdrawal is masked as relapse. Like, see, you really do need the meds. Like, so it's this, it's this tendency to blame the patient rather than blame the drug. Even me, this is, gonna, this is a funny story, but I started experiencing severe anxiety as I tapered the benzo under medical supervision. And I thought it was caffeine. So I quit caffeine. Well, then I still had the anxiety. So then I thought, well, maybe it's the cigarettes that I smoke here and there. So I quit smoking. Not once did I, it dawn on me, it's the medication that's increasing my anxiety. So it's just interesting to me that we don't really blame the drug. We blame the patient or something else. I don't know. So um, let's move on to another one. There's so many good questions. Um, hold on. There's uh, kind of questions about like, how do we holistically care for mental health problems? What are they really? If it's not a chemical imbalance, then what is it? Who wants to go? Drew, you're, you're on. <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll jump in to give the psychiatrists a little more time to plan their answers because it's, it's a challenging question for sure. Um, I'll just, um, I'll speak to, I, I think, um, like when we talk about mental health and we talk about the DSM, I think it's helpful to look at that as like one framework and like in the medical like halls of University of Nebraska Medical School where I went to school or, you know, the hospital, it's like that is the one way of looking at things. And um, I think if you can take a step back, um, there like it, it's, so it's more of a like anthro, uh, I'm trying to, uh, anthropological question of like how do how do culturally like how do we deal with hardship you know in human society like at one point this was like a question of religion um you'd go to the priest you go to the uh you know when you're having a hard time in, in buddhism it's like they accept that there is suffering in life um and so i'm just pointing out pointing to the fact that the in the medical version of reality it's like the dsm is is one way of framing um symptoms and i guess i also want to say that for some people that's really um it's there's a a big benefit of that if they have this explanatory model of saying oh like it's not my fault it's you know, this medical condition that i'm suffering from um, so sometimes that like the dsm diagnosis it is helpful to, to patients in kind of understanding their story and not feeling, not, um, not feeling like it's all on them. So um, getting to the second part of the question of what do we do instead? Um, you know, I've been really interested in fields called lifestyle medicine and mind-body medicine. Um, I think some of the leaders in those fields are like Dean Ornish. Um, he's done some work around heart disease and mind-body medicine. I looked at James Gordon and the Center for Mind-Body Medicine. Um, I've, I've participated in some of their, their work and um, they do it in group therapy types of settings, like eight, eight weeks of two hours. And honestly, like a lot of the group work is stuff that you might've done in kindergarten, like 
drawing pictures of yourself, like solving your big problem and then talking about what that looks like and sharing your feelings with people or moving your body and dancing. There's so many things that um, are part of being, you know, a whole human expressing yourself um, that kind of get repressed or pushed down culturally. Um, and I think that stepping into wholeness is, is part of um, moving towards good health. Um, so it's a, that, um, a lot of a big topic and some abstract ideas in there, but I'll leave it, leave it there for now. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, I, I'll, thank you. Um, so yeah, just, just to add a little bit, I'll, I'll, I'm going to come right out and say, I actually think the DSM is kind of a piece of crap, to be honest with you. I don't think it's, I honestly don't think it's very useful. And I think it's, well, it's useful for the pharmaceutical companies and for the insurance billing. Those two things it is useful for, but I don't think so much else, at least the way that I kind of see and think about diagnoses and causes and kind of the person is in front of me, I find that there's very little help in the DSM as far as what it does and how it classifies. And definitely when you think about, okay, well, GAD, great, generalized anxiety disorder. So, so now what? Oh, that equals Zola. Like that just, yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't, I don't find it too helpful. I mean, yeah, the answer to what causes things or what causes mental anguish or mental health problems, I think you could almost say everything, <laughs> right? I mean, everything from um, society and the way that, the, the way that we're struck, the way that, uh, that we're taught, the educational system, um, our relationship with our parents, um, trauma that we had here and there, like just anything and everything can influence our mental health. Um, and then, you know, of course, you know, if we think about the like biopsychosocial, right? So lots of societal factors, poverty, right? Um, the psychological stuff, trauma, abuse. Um, and then of course, uh, there's a lot of biological things. So like, you know, I mentioned B12 deficiency and some of the stuff that I, you know, work that I do, we look at how certain, certain diets and certain foods actually can cause, you know, mental health symptoms and different things. So again, I think I'm, I keep coming back to this like cause and effect thing because I really think that I just, I, I believe that if you don't, if you don't understand the cause, um, you're, you're almost always going to be missing the boat when you come to like designing a treatment plan. I mean, not always. There's some things that I think you can do without 100% understanding it. But I think uh, the more you can understand it, the better you can kind of tailor that treatment. And as far as uh, interventions, I can tell you, I listed some that, that I use. I mean, I use uh, yoga, specifically Kundalini yoga, a lot of mind body stuff, um, a lot of, um, you know, like I said, diet and uh, nutritional stuff, a lot of like, okay, let's figure out how you can get more friends <laughs> um, if loneliness is the problem. A lot of, um, uh, you know, what I see a lot is people coming in with just really horrific jobs that it's just like it's not it's not matched right or really kind of a horrific relationship and so the idea is as long as that's there as long as you're in this um really poor fit work uh or really poor fit relationship you can throw as much prozac or zoloft or whatever you want at that but it's not going to change that it's not going to change that situation so helping people to figure out and recognize kind of what's going on and to come back to the um, the point of my belief and how I see it is that every person is, is their own best doctor, right? You know your body way better than I know your body and way better than any doctor's ever going to know your body. Even if I asked you a thousand questions and did every me medical test that I could do, you're still going to be the expert, not me. And so I think my opinion of kind of what, what I do is, um, I guess, a little bit different from the, the, the model, the kind of mainstream model, whereas I see that, you know, I can help, right? I can help you. I can help you look. I can help you find. I can help um, you hone your intuitive skills. I can help you figure out how to listen to your body. Um, and I think that's what, I think that's, you know, a big thing that I can, a big way that I can actually help people is to just help them access their own inner wisdom. Um, from what I see, I believe that pretty much all psychiatric medications across the board do the exact opposite of that. So um, they decrease your ability to know what's going on in your own body. They cover it up, they skew it, <laughs> they make everything weird to the point where um, you're literally just disconnected from your body, right? It's just like this total kind of disconnection. And that's again, like, you know, why mind body medicine, I think is so helpful because 
it's literally the concept of mind body medicine is rejoining the mind and the body together, right? It's, it's, it's letting them know each other and letting it flow back and forth. And so I think that's, and at least I believe why it's one of the most kind of powerful and effective things that we can do for people who are disembodied, um, w w be it from, you know, psychiatric medications or trauma or whatever else that's causing it. Yeah, the, the holistic approach, the way that I've begun to think about it, because I am pretty, pretty early on in this personal journey as far as redefining and um, reconsidering, you know, what, what this career path and what this degree could look like for me as I stray further away from that sort of more traditional allopathic path. When I think about holistic, um, I think about reversing the authority. So, so the authority will not be coming from me as the doctor or provider, but given back or rediscovered by you as the client or the patient, right? Um, and I think that's similar to the idea of, of true informed consent, right? We are, we are partners in this journey. It is, it is your experience. It's your human experience that has led you to this point. How can I walk the path next to you um, as opposed to just dictating for you or to you. Um, I think that for me is, is the beginning of how I'm thinking about holistic psychiatry. Um, definitely quite different from the experiences of a lot of you in the film where there was something that was handed to you, uh, a directive that was passed to you from someone who allegedly um, has an ex, you know, an expert opinion or some expert advice um, that could be redefined, you know, flipped back onto you. You know, this idea of that, you know, that Kendra mentioned that you are the one who knows yourself the best. And, you know, we, we as this uh, person along with you on your journey stand sort of humbly next to you to try to help you rediscover you, um, given what you have experienced, you know, whether it be a trauma or, you know, whatever other slice of humanity, because that's kind of really what it all is. It's, you know, being human. The, one of the psychiatrists in the film mentioned that, um, you know, we shouldn't be confusing normal sadness and normal anxiety with a mental disorder. We are so quick to pull that trigger with labeling. And obviously that has a lot to do with the pharmaceutical industry as they, as they uh, mentioned very, very well in the film. Um, and why should we be doing that? That's such a wonderful question. Like, you know, if, if numb is a goal, then what, do we lose what gets destroyed for us in the process, you know, so to re, you know, to uncover, rediscover, um, and help people work through is how I've begun to think of a more holistic approach. So, wow. I'm just so, I'm just so honored to hear your answers. They're just so, I don't know what to say, like as a former patient, like they give me hope, you know, cause I, I'm around mental health professionals very often doing, doing what I do. And like I say, you know, you people scare me. Like, I don't <laughs> want to be around you. I have to be careful what I say. And a lot of people take it as like, they'll pigeonhole me as a patient. Like, well, you need to do this. And I'm like, no, you need to back off. Like, I don't need to do anything. So it's just so refreshing to hear that, that the power is back to the patient that I'm walking humbly next to you, that I'm helping you reconnect with who you are inside. That is just that's beautiful to me that that is like rethinking psychiatry to me um there's there's a lot of um in the in the q a about ocd bipolar severe conditions about um well we get this often that you know the people in the film they're pretty normal they're not severe but i would reject that and say i was actually labeled as chronic persistent severe mental illness i didn't leave my house for years like I, you see the good parts of me. So don't assume that we're not as bad as we were. But anyway, so it's kind of a segue. Let's talk about like serious, you know, you have serious OCD. This is not just like grief from, you know, a, you broke up with a girlfriend or something. Um, mostly this person said they came off the meds. They're three and a half years, mostly recovered from the meds, but the OCD is still interfering with their life on a momentary basis. Uh, and then the other person is talking about bipolar disorder and that he asked his provider, is there any alternatives, non-pharmacological alternatives for bipolar? And he said, no, there, we don't, I don't know of any, we don't learn that in school. So let's talk about the more severe 
quote unquote. Yeah, I just wanted to say, so yeah, it's interesting. I was having this conversation with uh, a young girl who um, is undergrad and she was interested in becoming a holistic psychiatrist. And she, I was having a conversation with her the other day and she was asking me all these questions and somehow it came up where she was like, oh, so that's great. So you help people with depression and anxiety, you know? And I was like, no, I, I have other people as well. She's like, but not like people with schizophrenia or bipolar disorder or anything like that. And I was like, oh no. I do. A hundred percent. Yes, absolutely. Um, so, so I guess what I'm trying to say is, yeah, I, I think that um, there is this, there is this idea or myth or whatever you call it that, um, that, yeah, that only people with mild, you know, depression and anxiety are the people that um, could benefit from holistic treatments or may be able to succeed off of medications. I know that was a message I think that was drilled into me in residency. Like I, I don't ever remember um, any of my attendings or anyone really telling me that that, I mean, that was what they say. Like, you know, if you have sch severe schizophrenia, you're going to be on medications for life. And same probably for bipolar disorder. So that's what I was taught. Um, but since, since I, you know, have opened this practice and got all the, you know, training and done everything that I've done and then started actually working with these folks, I have found that to be not the case. So, so um, yes, uh, these types of interventions, these types of things, uh, you know, alternatives um, to medications can and do work for people who with, you know, quote, serious mental illnesses, for people with bipolar disorder and schizophrenia. Are they more challenging? <laughs> um, is it more, a little bit more complex, especially when we're talking about getting off medications, especially when we're talking about getting, getting off of, you know, really high doses of antipsychotics and things like that? Yes, it can be, um, but, but there, there are options. And these are, these, yeah, you absolutely don't have to believe that, you know, if you have one of these diagnoses, you have to take, you know, strong, heavy medications for life. There are options and there are ways to treat, to treat them without medications or with minimal medications. Yeah, I would agree with that. And I think that um, one of the things that Kendra mentioned earlier that's also very significant is our body, you know, the mind-body connection and its ability to sort of heal itself as well. Like we, uh, I think at our very foundation, uh, the human body is also equipped for healing if we allow it to, or if we uh, create an environment in a situation where that actually can happen. And I think that all of the uh, quote unquote holistic or, you know, kind of basic approaches that Kendra had mentioned earlier really plays into that. They all play a very, very significant role. So if you do have somebody who is struggling with a diagnosis of bipolar one disorder and may maybe that they're on three or four medications, uh, it could also very well be the case that they are still struggling from a more, psych you know, a more interpersonal level uh, with other issues that could be addressed in a simple way. Uh, for example, nutrition, diet, exercise, movement, you know, the, their own personal home situation, et cetera. There's, there are many, many ways that are non-pharmacological uh, that we could target that and try to improve those, those pieces of the puzzle so that there may be some clarity with a minimal amount of medication or maybe none at all. You know, it's a step-by-step -step sort of a process. Um, and I think that the holistic approaches would, are there are universally beneficial uh, across the board, whether some, somebody has symptoms that are mild all the way across the continuum to more severe. Yeah, I'll weigh in briefly on this one. Um, so as a primary care doctor, you know, I'm not often, you know, really ever making the diagnosis, diagnosis of schizophrenia or bipolar disorder. Usually, you know, I make a referral to psychiatrist and somebody for a new diagnosis. But um, I see plenty of people that carry those diagnoses, um, whether when I was in residency in the hospital or now in the clinic or, you know, at long-term care facilities and things like that. And I just think it's, it's a really complicated terrain. I mean, there's lots of little parts um, to sort out um, in the sort of status quo. Um, and I think um, uh, sort of an unfortunate part of, of that status quo is, um, is this a patholo uh, pathologizing? Um, um, this might be un kind of tangentially related, but when we pathologize, like, features that we don't like, um, like medications are used in a, like, especially like in a long-term care facility um, to just kind of help manage 
you know, and, and so uh, like from a nursing perspective, from a just keeping the peace kind of perspective, antipsychotic medications have kind of a sedative effect. Um, and, or, and so um, I think that, um, you know, it's, it's a complicated terrain, but part of the problem, I think, you know, even in my clinic is we, we sort of, I, sometimes I think severe mental illness, whether we, whatever particular label it has, um, ends up becoming sort of uh, like an end cap, like kind of a lost cause kind of like attitude and medications are used to kind of maintain sort of a stable status quo. And it honestly is pretty hard to imagine the types of human resources that might be needed, you know, in terms of social work, in terms of therapy, in terms of, you know, community support to actually rehabilitate somebody who's, who is in a pretty unfortunate situation. And it is, you know, certain labels are applied to it and certain medication regimens applied to it. And it's kind of a unfortunate, kind of uh, uh, not, uh, not ideal situation. So it's, uh, it's complicated. <laughs> Yeah, and I just wanted to mention, um, there's a couple of groups, if any professionals in the audience want to look into, there's one called ISPS, where it's about um, psycho psychological and social treatments for persons experiencing psychosis. There's some patient led movements, one is uh, hearing voices. So it's a group of people that learn to like, I don't know, to not be so afraid of their voices and to like, work with them instead of it being something that needs to go away and be suppressed and shut down. There's also um, open dialogue therapy, which you can be trained at, trained as a practitioner. I think it's in Massachusetts and New York State does it, but it's from overseas. And they found that I think it was 83% of first time episodes of psychosis stayed off psychiatric medication two years after the event because they did more of a holistic approach where they brought the family, the context in, they talk to everyone. You don't talk about a patient behind their back. You talk about them there with everyone together to find out what's going on, what has broken down in the family system, what has broken down in the community. And they have this very interesting view that the person experiencing the symptoms is like the canary in the coal mine saying like something is wrong here. So it's not that the patient is the one that's broken, it's the system. So that's, um, there's, so there's so many other, my point is there's so many other ways of viewing these mental problems, you know, that I always find it interesting, like we talk about human rights and civil rights, but then when it comes to those people, like they don't count, like they are subject to, I mean, extreme violence of um, forced treatment, forced injecting, you know, medications, just the brutality of having that label is just, it keeps me awake at night, honestly. So um, I just invite everyone to like, reevaluate what you think about people with those labels, I guess. So I don't know, we're, we could just, we're saying so many good things. Um, I'm thinking about, let's see, let me just scan really quick. There's a lot, a lot of things, a lot of people asking about like mindfulness, yoga. Then there's a discussion about black box warnings. Recently there was an FDA label. I don't even know if you all saw it about benzodiazepines, but what happened was a couple years ago, we did a drive and we had a lot of patients report their drug adverse reactions to the FDA. And now they're finally saying like benzos do have a withdrawal syndrome, but it's putting a lot of fear in people that when doctors see that, maybe they're going to do like the opiate crisis and cut people off suddenly. So with the pandemic happening, there's been a 30% increase in benzo mm. prescriptions. So it's like, we're digging a hole, you know, but that also points to there's a real reason for you to have anxiety right now. And that would be a normal reaction to a pandemic. So I don't know. Does anyone want to take any of those and run with it? I'll, I'll jump in. Why not? <laughs> uh, just speaking to mindfulness, um, you know, that's, it's a topic I've kind of gotten more interested in um, over time. And, and par partially because as we've been talking about it, I just see like the hopefulness attached to it. Um, as far as like a primer to pr mindfulness, um, I would say that, you know, choose resources that are appealing to you, kind of like with exercise. It's like, if you enjoy what, you know, if you kind of enjoy the process, you're more likely to stick with it. Um, and so for some people like sitting cross-legged on a cushion, closing their eyes and looking at a candle for 10 minutes sounds impossible. And, you know, maybe that could change, but maybe that's just not the thing for you. Um, um, I do think the Center for Mind Body Medicine 
um, is doing awesome work. And um, James Gordon has a book called The Transformation on the work that they've done in groups teaching some simple mindfulness skills. Um, but yeah, my quick point would just be to find the things that you enjoy doing or that are interesting to you and do those. Um, like even like a musician who practices music and is atten you know, paying attention to the, the keys on the piano or you know, the sound of the trumpet, like tuning into what you're doing in the moment is mindfulness. So it doesn't have to be a certain you know, practice that you've never done before. Um, just bringing more attention to the process is, is kind of what we're talking about. And um, there are a lot of resources out there. <laughs> it can be overwhelming. So I understand if, if you keep hearing this and you're not as familiar with it and it feels like a lot. <laughs> Yeah, I, I just wanted to add, um, I, I love mindfulness. I use it myself every day. <laughs> I use it with a lot of patients. Um, one thing that just strikes me about one kind of aspect of mindfulness that's, I guess, really relevant to the prescribing and to the film is this relationship with like a negative thought or a negative feeling, right? It's that, you know, we are taught we're just taught as a society that if you have a negative thought or a negative feeling, like you have to get rid of it. That's the, this, the goal is to get rid of it, right? And that's why if you take Xanax, it will get rid of it and everything will be okay. If you take Prozac, you will get rid of it. Like that's the goal, get rid, get rid, get rid, get rid of all these things. Um, when really what you learn in mindfulness is, well, number one, that strategy doesn't work, right? If, you, if, you, if I tell you not to think of a pink elephant, all you're gonna think about right now is a pink elephant. Um, so the more you actually try to get rid of a thought or try to push it away, it's usually actually gets much stronger. So what I like about mindfulness is this, I always tell people to think of it like, you know, as like the negative thought that's kind of like knocking at your door, right? You could just keep ignoring it, keep ignoring it, but probably it's just gonna get louder and louder, right? Um, an alternative is to open the door, say, hey, what's up? Come on in. Hey, have a seat on my couch. Can I get you a drink? Like, what's up? Let's talk. Why are you here? What's going on? Just kind of befriending that thought. Um, yeah, which again, is like pretty much the exact opposite of, you know, popping Xanax, right? It's the exact opposite approach. So that's one of the reasons why I think mindfulness is so powerful. And I, I, I love it. And it is, it is the anti-medicine in my mind in so many ways, right? It's kind of the opposite approach of things. So I think it's pretty awesome. I think one of the challenges when we discuss these kinds of approaches with patients really is trying to deconstruct this idea of like a quick fix. And uh, I think it was Whitaker in the film that talked about this magic bullet. And we're just so, it's so ingrained in us that, you know, there is going to be a fix to this. And I think Kendra, you mentioned this earlier, like it needs to be fixed. If it needs to be fixed, that implies that there's something that is broken, okay? So then we're implying that that's me, the patient is broken, I need to be fixed. And I want that fix to be permanent and sort of quick. Uh, and we, we did, our discourse is always along those lines, you know, that, that the fix should be quick. And when we think, when we discuss approaches like mindfulness, I like to remind patients that, this is not a quick fix sort of a scenario. So, so if, you're, if your belief is that you may sit down on a cushion for 10 minutes for two or three days, and then all of a sudden everything is going to be the way that you want it to be, uh, we're, what we're not saying is that uh, in the place of this pill of Prozac is going to be 20 minutes of mindfulness. We can't do like a dose conversion from uh, you know, ph pharmaceutical to to mindfulness training. And that, that's a challenge because I think that a lot of folks by the time, you know, when they do get to us, they're, they're suffering, they're feeling sometimes desperate um, that nothing else has worked or nothing else may be working. And if we say anything other than uh, this, this will help you feel better right away, it, that feels challenging, that, that feels uncomfortable, that feels very difficult for people. So to uh, remind them of the process and that you know, these symptoms are messages that are important uh, to sort of deconstruct and decipher and that the quick fix is not what we want because if we, if we grab it uh, and we sort of numb ourselves with the medication or assume that it's going to make it go away, then we lose the lesson in it. Uh, whatever that may be or may have been uh, also gets lost in that process. Um, I think that most, most of you in the film really alluded to that e even without specific words like, gosh, this, this has sort of um, stunted me from being able to do the work that I needed to do to get through the grief or the trauma or whatever it is, right? And, but, but that is an important message that we need to convey to all of our patients. Like, it's not gonna look like just taking a pill. We can't do a one, it's not a one-to-one -one ratio. It's gonna be a different kind of experience that's going to lead you down a path that may feel uncomfortable, but we're not gonna pathologize the discomfort. We're going to feel it and learn from it and move 
through it to get to that other side. So. Totally. Yeah. I often say like, I feel like I kicked the can down the road, you know, like the, the problems are still there and now I have to deal with them now, but now it's 17 years later. Yeah. And I often say, I feel like I, my, my own healing process was kind of robbed from me. I didn't know any better, you know? So it's definitely, it's definitely a thing. Um, there's a question. I'm trying to combine a few of these together and then we'll start to wrap up, but kind of like this, this concept of, I'm going to use lots of air quotes. How do you treat trauma? And secondarily, is there another term you prefer over mental illness or disorder? So there's this need for new language, right? So like mm -hmm. if, we, if we're saying that the chemical imbalance is just a theory that was never proven and these labels that we get are just insurance billing codes and people really have real suffering that makes them miserable, how do we treat those things or not? I don't know. What do you think? I'd like to respond to that, to how do you treat trauma? So first off, there's a wonderful book um, called The Body Keeps the Score. I don't, I'm, probably you guys have read it, but um, read that <laughs> if you, to, to know what, it's just, it's an excellent, excellent uh, uh, explanation of what trauma is, how trauma actually affects our brain, our tissue, every, every cell in our body is actually affected by trauma. So it turns out that, well, first off, guess what, medications? not really helpful for the treatment of trauma. Big surprise there. Are, are they used to, to are, do we uh, medicate trauma? Yes, a lot, except for we call it bipolar disorder or ADHD or something else. We, we call it something else and then we give it a medication, um, in my opinion. Um, but yes, so I, what I believe and what I've seen and what you know kind of is alluded to in the research and everything in that book is that to fix the body, you have to use the body. So what I've seen time and time again, and this is actually why I use yoga and Kundalini probably as the two uh, biggest uh, somatic type of interventions that I use, is that using somatic, using body, using the body to help the body, I found to be probably one of the most effective ways. Does psychotherapy help? Yes, for sure. And I think probably for some people, it's a, it's a good balance of some kind of somatic intervention, whether it be like some energy work or yoga or breathing or whatever, probably combined with psychotherapy, I would say is, you know, maybe the most, most effective. But um, from what I've seen and from what I've seen in treating lots of folks uh, with trauma, there may be some people who can get away with just the, there's almost no one where medication is going to do anything. So that's, that's that. Like, um, as far as therapy is concerned, I think there's a subset of people that therapy may be enough. Personally, what I've seen with my, you know, a lot of patients that I see, the therapy isn't always necessarily effective. You have to add something else. You have to add something physical, some somatic level intervention. Um, but it can be treated. This is the thing that I, you know, this is the, the great story that I love to tell my patients, which is like, it can, it can be treated. If you've heard that it can't, you're wrong. It's treatable. It's, it's extremely treatable. It, you just have to use the right intervention. That's it. I think it's interesting. I'll, just, um, I'll go ahead, Drew. Okay, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, this this topic, the topic of trauma. Boy, that feels like um, it's it's more and more just part of the common lexicon these days, and um, and it is a very important topic. Um, I went to a conference with a lot of the spe speakers in the field recently, and have been learning a lot of it on my own. And I think it's worth pointing out that like this really wasn't training I got in medical school <laughs> or residency. I mean, we did talk about trauma somewhat, but not really in the cutting edge way, um, you know, not from the cutting edge way that's happening now. And, and that research has been kind of on my own. Um, Gaber Mate is a family medicine doctor who works with addiction. Um, and he, in, in one of the calls I was on, he defined trauma, um, kind of from the origin of the word is about a wound. And so he, he made the point that, you know, trauma isn't just when bad things happen to you. Um, like, because the, the human system is resilient, bad things happen to you. You know, that's one, you know, that's not trauma. Trauma is the wound that happens when, um, when you don't respond from it. And, you know, in kind of a metaphorical way, um, it's like, if we, if um, if there was this bad thing that happened to you in the past that um, comes up again so many other times in the future, that's the wound that is still not healing. 
Um, and so that's, that's where the trauma is. And so, um, you know, how, um, in order to, what healing it would look like would be allowing that wound to heal so that it is not coming up again and you're able to be in the present moment and future, uh, future events. Um, and what does that healing, you know, what does that trauma treatment look like? You know, a lot, from my perspective, a lot of the effective work happens in groups. Um, I, I was referring to James Gordon's work earlier in his book, The Transformation, is about his small groups healing trauma. Um, and yeah, <laughs> I'll leave it there. Um, Angie, I agree with you that, you know, we are looking for a new language to try to help us uh, discuss topics such as trauma. I mean, I remember in my training, we were still using the DSM-4 and I would read the list. You know, they, they try to quantify what constitutes a traumatic event, you know, in the DSM um, and just kind of glancing through it and thinking like, really, that's it? You know, like, and, and learning how, how do we ask patients about trauma and we're injecting these specific examples based on what's in the DSM. That seems so short-sighted um, and so inefficient. It's just not enough. And I think that, you know, why, widening the scope, widening the lens and understanding like what you referred to, to as well, Drew, is, you know, the, the wounds that we carry related to those experiences um, is so much more important than, again, sort of treating a symptom with an antidepressant medication. I mean, I, I remember thinking too, why is it that an SSRI is approved to treat PTSD? Like that doesn't, that just doesn't make any sense. It doesn't really make any sense. Um, yet that's what we're continuing to do without sort of delving a little bit deeper. Um, and I think that the, the discussion of more somatic work and the, uh, one of the things that interests me related to these types of questions too is this the ideas of like rites of passage you know let's just you know let's let's talk about grief okay so you've lost somebody that you care about very deeply a parent a child a spouse a significant other is there a way that you're honoring that loss you know working through with um, um, rituals traditions groups those kinds of things I think are also very very useful um, and can be very very healing and in in today's world in the, you know in the pandemic times where you had mentioned Angie the prescription for benzodiazepines going up you know we are shortchanging ourselves because we are missing you know we're missing some opportunities to be able to honor those rites of passage we're we're stuck in the in the middle where we're we're kind of feeling like we're not allowed to do that or we're being um, kept from doing it. And I think that the, the wounds will unfold from that as well. So how can, how can we honor all of that as we're looking into the more immediate future without having to resort to a prescription medication? Those are really salient and important questions for the months to come. Excellent. Well, I'm mindful of the time. I could probably talk to you all for another hour, but it's late. <laughs> so um, if you want to just go around, say any closing thoughts, maybe even about your own personal journey of how you come to see these things or what you hope for the future for yourself or for, for other, other prescribers out there that are watching. We have a lot of doctors in the audience and then say like where people can find you and then I'll close it out. <laughs> I'll go. I'll go. Um, okay. So yeah, so I actually came to where I am, well, th through a million different paths, but ultimately myself had um, hit a point when I was about four years outside of residency, working in an emergency room in New York City. Um, and I was physically and mentally a hot mess and not doing very well. And basically kind of hit full on burnout, rock bottom, even to the point of having suicidal thoughts. Um, and at the same time, actually had been wanting for many years to have children, which of course seemed like not even something that I could even fathom in the context of this horrible place that I was in. And I actually went to this wonderful, she was a primary care physician and long story short, she said to me, you know, you can still get pregnant and you could also probably get off all these medications if you just like made some changes and whatever. Very simple. She didn't give me like mind blowing, like no like crazy, crazy stuff, just like very simple advice. But it was enough for me to say, hey, she's right. <laughs> and so that's what I did. And I started doing all the things that I now help my patients to do. I started implementing all these, uh, you know, lifestyle changes and everything like that. Um, 
And long story short, um, they worked. And I was, I think at the time that I started this, I was on like 15 different medications or something like that crazy. Um, and I got down to zero and I was able to um, successfully have a child and actually have had have two children now. Anyway, um, so, so that's kind of my story and how I came to this. Um, but what's been interesting for me is that, or I guess what I struggle with is that now I'm doing this. I, I'm, I'm a holistic psychiatrist and I have this fabulous practice and I have all these fabulous patients and I'm doing, I'm, I'm seeing and doing lots of good things. Um, but I'm at the point where I'm only one person. And so my organization has expanded and we've hired some more psychiatrists, but I guess, um, I'm not sure if I'm even answering your question here, but one of, one of the things that I just want to, I guess, make happen, and I'm not exactly sure how to do that, but having this, uh, this film and doing these kinds of things is certainly one of those ways, is to just like shout this idea out there, right? To start telling people, because there's so many psychiatrists out there and other mental health pro professionals who don't know this stuff. I was not taught any of this. At pretty much everything that I now do with my patients on a daily basis is either the exact opposite of what I was taught in residency or, you know, it's, it's not what I was taught. I had to go find and seek this information for myself. So I guess, yeah, I just would like to say that, yeah, I, my, my hope is that we can keep spreading this word because it's like there's, the patients are all figuring it out on their own, right? That's the interesting thing. Like the patients and they're there and they're figuring it out. So they need, they need us. They need some people that can, you know, guide and assist and, you know, and be there for them. Um, and then I think your last part was just about how to, what was the last question? Sorry. The last oh, part of the question. It's like your hope for the future and where people can find you if they want. Okay. To yeah. Well, my, my hope for the future is just that more people become aware of this topic. It's very interesting. I'm actually reading this huge, really thick book called Pharma. Um, it's fascinating to me because I didn't realize that. So, so what's happening now with psychiatric medications? We've done this. We did it with antibiotics. We did it with barbiturates. Like this is not a news, a new news story. It's just a different class of medications, but it's the same old story. Um, so yeah, so I think we need to just, yeah, education, awareness. I don't know how we tackle the pharmaceutical industry, but that needs to happen. Um, basically just spreading the word, I think, you know, because, you know, again, there's a lot of patients that come to me. And they say, you know, for 10 years, nobody told me this. Nobody told me this was a thing. And I, I had to figure it out for myself. So spreading it. Um, yes. So uh, in getting in contact with me would be my nonprofit is called Free Range Psychiatry. And we have a website. So um, freerangepsych.org is the best way um, to uh, check out what we do. We have tons of information there about what we do and what we offer and yeah, ways to contact us. So thank you so much for, for, for uh, letting me be a part of this. Too. This is so amazing. Yeah, thank you so much, Angie, for, for having me and for the filmmakers and to you and to everybody brave enough to participate in this amazing documentary. I mean, this is such a wonderful way to uh, spread the word uh, about how everybody's got a voice. Everybody has a right to advocate for themselves and to share their story so that more and more of us grow in our understanding and our own personal evolution without people like you, without people like the other folks in the film, we wouldn't be where we are right now, right? We wouldn't be having, we may not even be having this conversation today. And I feel uh, very grateful for that to, you know, to share this information and to discuss it and to think about how important it is for the future. It's simple. The simplicity of it is really, uh, I think, quite beautiful, you know, that what we're advocating for is to return uh, to an, a better understanding of self through some very holistic, which are also very simple means of, um, of, improving um, our sense of what these symptoms are, gaining a better understanding of them, and not reverting immediately to the sort of mainstream uh, status quo that is out there. My hope for the future is that we can continue to do that and to turn things around so that when, there, when we are in a cultural challenge or a global challenge like this one, um, we can uh, sustain regenerative practices and, as opposed to reverting to ones that can cause harm potentially. Um, so that we can better understand each other and move forward that way. Um, and to find me right now, I'm mostly just home, homeschooling. <laughs> uh, but uh, hopefully soon I'll be coming to a, a website near you. So that's awesome. Drew. Yeah, great. Uh, wow. <laughs> um, I'll just speak a, a little bit to the doctors in the audience, a, a little bit about my own story. Um, 
I think I took a sort of unusual step after finishing my residency of taking some time off. <laughs> I feel like there's a taboo in our field um, against not working. Um, you know, we've invested so much money and time and energy into our training. And it's almost like this obligation, you know, because I am a board certified family medicine doctor, if I'm not working, you know, six days a week, you know, on call at nights, you know, I'm not earning the privilege to, you know, to ever be admitted to medical school in the first place or something, something like that. Um, and so over the last year, you know, I did a three month contract, you know, over the winter and right now I'm working part time and um, that just allowing more time in my life is something that gives me the space to read books and, to, you know, go to conferences and just to think about things and also to take care of myself. And I feel like that's such an important part early on in the process, way before you open your own clinic and, you know, start, um, you, you know, providing somewhat controversial, you know, advice, advice to people is, is just learning to take care of yourself. And as doctors, I feel like we really, um, you know, we have, there's the topic of physician wellness and physician burnout um, that I think are, you know, coming into mainstream, you know, coming into our attention more and more because they are a big problem. And so anyways, I'm just speaking to, um, to how I've taken care of myself by slowing down a little bit. Um, I, I did participate in this conference with about 25 medical students um, who were just about to start their residency and they're interested in holistic health. Um, and, you know, I, I shared with them about my experience and I also taught them some writing exercises, just a chance, you know, when you're working a lot and you feel like your perspective, you know, you're just like stuck in the system, at least having a little outlet of just sharing your own private thoughts and feelings and stuff, just so it goes somewhere um, is, a, is a helpful little step. Um, as far as where I see myself going, um, and something that didn't come up, I don't think explicitly earlier, but I feel like it is one of the big areas of problem in our current health system is in relationship. I feel like patients, you know, are best served in a relationship and, you know, day in, day out, I see patients who they don't have a doctor, you know, they've been to the ER, they've been to the urgent care, you know, they've seen other doctors in the clinic and like, they, I don't know if they even expect to see me again, you know, they're just there to see a doctor and um, and it's, you know, it's, it's really a shame that that has, that that kind of doctor patient relationship has been broken as badly as it has. Um, but I, I feel like the future, at least for myself is, is probably in the direction of entrepreneurship and a practice that specifically focuses on, you know, the kind of relationship where I can support people, you know, in an empowering path to their health. And there's a lot of reasons why that's intimidating to me. Um, the financial, you know, so many skills that I haven't learned about running a business and, and intimidation about charge, you know, the amount of money I would need to charge in order to, you know, support myself, you know, I take the time that I need to. Um, there's definitely a lot of obstacle, you know, there's a lot of challenges in, in the path forward, but I, I do think it's the path forward uh, because we can't, we can't make it work in the system is, you know, in the conventional system is my view for myself. So, if you want to keep an eye on what I'm up to, my name's Drew Dydal, and I do have a Facebook page called The Good Life Clinic. And my goal at The Good Life Clinic is to partner with patients in caring for their human frame. And it's a project um, that is underway. Right now, it's basically some videos and some um, Facebook posts for me. But at some point, I would love to be seeing patients. <laughs> um, but I'm not feeling a lot of urgency around that in the next few months, at least. So. Uh, thanks, Angie and, and everyone for, for being here and being part of this. It's been a fun night. <laughs> it's been totally fun. Thank you, Drew, for seeing it and taking the opportunity and hosting your own. It's been awesome. Um, I'll just say a few things about the film really quick. If you want to share the film with any uh, colleagues, anyone in your network, we have a website. It's medicatingnormal.com. We also have a YouTube channel that has over 100 clips and other discussions just like this one that are on the YouTube channel. Um, we're all over social media. We now have a store that just opened a couple days ago. You can buy stickers and t-shirts if you want to support our outreach. And if you want to host a screening, just like Drew did, just email us at medicatingnormal at gmail.com. And lastly, there is a watch page and there's resources. There's a reading list. And we like to say, don't believe anything that we said. Go out there and read it yourself and do your own research and do your own journey. Because you, like, like Kendra said so beautifully, we are our own best doctors we are our own best advocates so 
Thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you so much for everything. And I hope to see you all down the road somewhere. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. All right. Good night, everybody. Good night.